So this is uh, basically uh, the implementation of uh, a bit of what Andrew talked about and the response to the revision of the 590 standards. And so I want to uh, kind of bear everything, and, and that is that we're, we're trying to go in and provide an assessment of the performance of a site assessment tool or of a phosphorus index. And we looked around and we have data, we have a lot of our own data, um, but certainly not uh, all the combinations of permutations of management and site condition that we need. And so we came up with a plan, and this is generally what these groups are doing, which is to rely on some fate and transport models to generate actually water quality data against which we can compare the, the ratings that are, gen are produced by the p-index. And so this should create immediate discomfort for any of you who have looked at models at all. And I have quite a large crew of modelers now, some of whom are uh, listed here. Um, but uh, I still am very uncomfortable with the approach. And so what I want to do right now is get a little bit into how we progressed into using these models and kind of convinced ourselves that they have you know, some utility in uh, what we want to do, which is basically to confirm that the P index is working or not working and even to help us to move that further. So this is a big regional project. There's a lot of resources that are being brought to bear, but I want to thank NRCS for a tremendous amount of uh, support here. And this involves essentially all the land grant institutions in the Chesapeake Bay region. So there's six of them. There's actually seven if you include an 1890 school, uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, and then uh, some federal partners. So we have these watersheds. There's small watersheds within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. This is the mid-Atlantic of the United States. And the idea was to set up this battleground. Each of these watersheds is a place where we know something about how phosphorus moves in an agricultural setting. And so we have a lot of people proposing new tools. Bring them on, okay? We're gonna bring them here, let them fight it out and find out which one works the best in this battleground. And we look at the data that we have and well, we have data to do some assessment, but not enough. So we're, gonna, we're also gonna use models then to help to forecast um, what particular management practices will do to the water quality in these. We took a physiographic approach, and so I'm just gonna take a quick second to introduce that to you because this is something that I think is very important. Andrew touched upon it. And we have tremendous collaboration in this region. It's longstanding. It goes back to when Andrew was, was there. Um, and so there are, of course, these geopolitical boundaries that we have between our states that cause there to be differences. That was one of the concerns with the phosphorus index to start with. Why are there 50 different P indices out there when we have these commonalities, certainly at a regional level? And so we've gone through on a physiographic basis, so areas where you have common management, common biogeochemical processes, and essentially look to see, can we come up with at least an assessment that's consistent across there, if not ultimately a pro, uh, propose some type of a phosphorus index that would be based on a physiographic uh, kind of boundary instead of a state boundary. And as Andrew pointed out, the likelihood that we'll be successful in convincing the states to adopt the physiographic approach is about zero. Um, but still, you can be idealistic. Here's the approach that we're taking to the project. The first thing is, we have to convince ourselves that we can use models to generate some kind of water quality estimate and that we're going to then compare the phosphorus index output to these models. And so our first stage, which has taken a long time and given me a lot of insight into modeling, is what we call model proving. So you've got a model out there, a fate and transport model, and it's supposed to do everything. So prove it. And I'll show you some results from that and, and some of the things. And we did this in an iterative way. We, our group is working primarily with SWOT, but we have some other models as well. These are USDA models primarily. And so the idea is run them in a place, see what they produce, look at the processes that they're representing, and then if it's not working, tweak it. We're not gonna develop an entirely new one, but tweak it. And so we've done a lot of tweaking. And then once we've convinced ourselves that it's working, then adapt it so it can speak the language of a p-index. So these, some of these models, SWOT is something that's applied at a watershed level. It has these different kind of chunks of space that aren't really real space that it, it uh, represents. Um, and so let's make it so that it speaks the same language, provides the same output, which is essentially field scale output as the P index. And so this is the stage that we've just completed. And then the fine thing is now that the two, the SWOT model and the P index are speaking the same language, Let's do an assessment. And the evaluation process, it turns out, isn't just of the phosphorus index. It's also of the SWOT model. Okay, so let's, I'm going to run through some of our watersheds to provide different examples of 
uh, the output of this particular project. So here's our long-term watershed. It's been there for uh, almost 50 years. Uh, we've done a lot of work looking at runoff generation. And the first thing you do is you build a database. And this is so kind of arcane, uh, it's ridiculous, but it's so fundamental to the process. So trying to bring together all the studies and all the data that are out there is very, very important. And you have to do this in order to get representation that allows you to compare something like SWOT to the p-index. So our database is basically specific to 300 fields that are in this watershed where there's been long-term um, monitoring. And uh, we essentially have taken all the management data and had to put a lot of work into just producing a darn database so that we can run the phosphorus index and run the SWOT model consistently. This is a tremendously important activity. It's one that I think we probably underestimated early on, but we're now pretty good at it. Okay, so once we did that, then we started running SWOT and testing it. So look, we're in a landscape where the runoff processes, so what moves phosphorus is that runoff water, are characterized by what we call variable source area hydrology. So this is a little bit, bit different than a lot of places in, in the Midwest where you have very, very well-drained soils or moderately well-drained soils. We have soils that range from well-drained to very poorly drained. And what generates runoff in our, in our area of the, this, the world is when water basically soaks through the soils and moves laterally and accumulates at certain positions in the landscape and makes the soils waterlogged. Okay, and so when you have a waterlogged soil in a spot, it doesn't take, my kids can go out there and tell you, yep, dad, if you spit on this soil, it's gonna run off. And that's basically the type of hydrology. So this actually is very important because most of the, the fate and transport models that are out there don't represent this type of hydrology. So there are a couple of versions of SWAT. Uh, there's the standard SWAT, which doesn't, isn't set up to represent what we call the saturation excess runoff. And then a newer version that our colleagues uh, from Virginia Tech had developed called TopoSWAT, which looks at this landscape process, water moving downhill and then accumulating at lower positions where it perches and then um, you, uh, you get a higher p potential for runoff. And so we convinced ourselves pretty quickly that we need to use this version of SWAT to accurately represent where runoff is getting generated in our landscapes. And so this was a fairly easy task, but it was still involved. So can't just use the model out of the box, you've got to use a variation of it. Um, and so we, we're using TopoSWAT to do that. So we've got much better spatial distribution because the p-index is all about identifying where you're going to have um, your potential for phosphorus loss. And then we really identified, uh, improved the identification of the sources in the one. Then we got to what I think is maybe the most important point from the talk that I'm giving right now. We got to the phosphorus routine that's in SWAT, that's actually a phosphorus routine that's in almost all the fate and transport models that are out there. This routine was developed in the mid 80s by the person who just spoke, and it was developed for the erosion prediction index calculator. So a model that's focused on erosion and is also growing a crop. It was not necessarily intended to do a great job in representing dissolved phosphorus losses, which have become a big part of what we try to assess when we're out there uh, running the, the p-index. And so the old version of this, this, this phosphorus routine, which is in, you can name the model, and there's some variation of this, of this particular routine in there, does not represent phosphorus that's sitting on the soil surface. What it does is it takes that phosphorus, if you, you apply it in a virtual world and you put your manure on the soil, it sticks it down in the soil, and then it gives it back to the soil solution so that it's either available for runoff or for, for plant uptake. And so a lot of what we do with the 4R strategy, when we look at it from an environmental standpoint, is we're trying to get the manure off the surface of the soil and down into the soil where it's available to the crop roots and, and not uh, sitting there available to runoff processes. So we actually uh, had a couple of colleagues, Pete Vadas and Mike White, both of them have, are, are modelers, sat down and they updated SWAT and they put new set of routines that allow basically manure to sit on the surface. That's all it does. Um, and when you compare the conventional SWAT to the, um, this, the new SWAT or the, the, the new routines, I want to make sure I don't turn things off again. Um, this is old, that's conventional, here's new. Um, what you see is when you just look at one of the four R's, this is the rate of uh, manure application, this is broadcast dairy slurry on the soil surface. You can see actually that the old routines have, uh, very, this was a, a springtime representation, this was I think a fall right there. They're very uh, unsensitive, they, they lack sensitivity with regard to the differences in rate. 
But with the new routines, you actually see um, the, the differences that you might expect uh, to, uh, to be represented in, in the output. So you, have, you put more manure on the surface, you get more phosphorus that runs off. So that's a bit concerning. Uh, and then uh, here's another one. This is looking at timing, another of the four R's for nutrient management stewardship. And so here we have dates right here and uh, going from uh, basically the middle of January to the middle of February. And you have a simulated single application of dairy slurry, same type of thing, um, to the soil. And with the old routines, what you see, first of all, is that there's it, what we call wash off or incidental transfer, this, this phenomenon of manure with high concentration of soluble phosphorus sitting on the surface being washed away by runoff water, that it really um, does not uh, show up with the older routines. In fact, they really don't look a lot different um, compared to what happened before you simulated the manure application. But with the new routines, you get this bump. And this is what we see with our empirical results. This is what's been published a lot in the literature. And so as we go through each of the four R's, we convinced ourselves pretty quickly that SWOT and presumably the other models aren't doing a terribly good job at representing the important processes, that uh, the environmental processes um, that we're trying to manipulate or manage um, when uh, we are, are in a four R nutrient management thing. So we've changed that and we're using the new routines in all of our models. And this was very important. It wasn't until we got to that point that we started to feel a little more comfortable about using SWOT or a, a simulation model to actually generate water quality data for ourselves. So let's move to the coastal plain now and I'll just kind of continue to perplex you. Um, coastal plain, this is a flat, flat uh, system. Um, and so here's actually a topo map of one of our field sites where we monitor drainage itches right there. It is flat. Only people who grew up there can tell you which, which way is up and which way is down. And so you can see the differences in, in elevation right here, you know, from five meters to 5.5 meters. And so you end up in this mind numbing type of an exercise where what you're doing is just trying to take different topographic maps, dif di different digital elevation maps and figure out which ones actually can represent the watersheds that uh, we're trying to model. And so we're, here's an example with a one meter digital elevation map. So it's the finest resolution that we have right there. And you can see there's a ditch that comes up here. So if you look at the, what we call ditch number six right there, its drainage basin actually is about like that. When we walk it off, it, it's about like it. But it, in, you know, it basically puts a catchment in here. It takes this other ditch, has it drain over there. These are artifacts then of the elevation model. They're not actually what's out there in reality. All right, so we go through this process over and over again, and you can even see the larger watershed right there. And you convince yourself that at least in the simulation study that um, you're hard pressed to do an accurate job of explaining things. And it gets even worse when you look at subsurface transfers. We have a special issue of Journal of Environmental Quality that just came out where in these systems, about 90% of the phosphorus moves in the subsurface. We don't really have any model out there that does a good job on that. So we actually have folks from the University of Delaware who are using various geophysical techniques to try to look at one factor, the p-index, which is the distance of the transport. If you look at in-storm, how far from a ditch is contributing. And so that's a very, very important addition to it. Where we have um, gotten further uh, and uh, in terms of some of the comparisons is up in New York State. So here's Factory Brook. This is up in the Allegheny Plateau right there. And so we've run uh, basically the, these are, uh, the topo SWAT. And what you see is when you compare the p-index results with what you get out of SWAT, this is very typical actually of the phosphorus index, which is, works well at certain sites, but not necessarily universally that you get these relationships that occur, but they're qualified. They're not a universal. You would expect if both of them were kind of working to, to represent all the processes ev evenly across an area, they, you would just get a kind of a one-to-one -one line there. You'd have just a single linear relationship. But you see that for corn and alfalfa fields in this watershed, we get one relationship. And for grass fields, we get another one. So um, we've gone in now in the exploration mode to figure out, well, what is it that's kind of working and what isn't working? And so we find for the New York Phosphorus Index that it is driven largely on the dissolve front. It's what we call a component index by um, the sources that you put there, not so much the transport, the runoff potential. And so then uh, when you look within SWAT, you see, uh, it, you know, this is comforting that when you look at just the amount of phosphorus that's applied to a field in the watershed, that we have a fairly good relationship 
with the um, with uh, the, the load of phosphorus that comes off in, in runoff. And so we're continuing to go down this path to, con to test each of the components of, of the uh, P index. So when you look kind of at a more, this, and this is uh, really being done more on a qualitative basis, so where it works and where it doesn't work in factory book, we see that up in the, basically the uplands, so up at the headwaters, we get pretty good correspondence between what the SWAT predicts and uh, what the P index predicts. But as we move down to a different set of soils, a different set of hydrologic, hydrologic processes, we get worse. And so this is helping us to understand where the, the model's performing and where the P index is performing well and where it isn't. We're using expert panels. Um, and yeah, I see that, John. Uh, and so we uh, have set up these expert panels, which are primarily planners, there's some farmers, there's some representatives from the environmental community and board, and then a lot of scientists to approach our assessment. And that is understanding that we can only believe the P index and we can only believe the models to a certain extent. And so we want people who are there that either have an agenda or expertise or hopefully both. And so we've selected these panels and we've met for a first round. And these panels are basically helping us with the process of charting out where do we want to go with nutrient management in the region, where do we want to go with uh, the phosphorus index, and later on Carl Zimmick is going to talk about a survey that we did which is very insightful, uh, and then as we conclude this project and we come up with recommendations for revisions to the, the P index, that they'll help us to interpret what the implications are. And so some very practical implications. If you change, say, distance to stream, um, what that might be and are we, we pushing things the right way. So here's the survey that you'll hear about in a little bit that um, Carl Zimmick is going to talk about, which was uh, looking at their opinions regarding how the P index is working right now and what they see to be modifications. 